Our scripture lesson this morning is 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 14. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. The Lord, the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Amen. When last we saw our hero, Elijah, he was on Mount Carmel challenging the prophets of Baal to a divine contest. Who can make their God rain down fire and consume the sacrifice? And Elijah's God won that battle. That was in 1 Kings chapter 18. But just winning the contest was not enough for Elijah. He decided also to slaughter all of the prophets of Baal. Important to the story is the fact that the religion of Baal happened to be the religion favored by the king and queen at the time, the queen in particular, and Queen Jezebel was none too pleased at having all of her prophets skewered. Elijah had already been a nuisance in the court before this, and with the slaughter of the prophets of Baal, Elijah found himself running for his life a scant seven verses later. Elijah runs into the wilderness. In fact, he crosses the border from Israel into Judah. With the Israelites divided into a northern and southern kingdom at the time, the north called Israel and the south called Judah, um, Elijah literally fled the country. Judah had its own king, so when Elijah crosses into Judah, he was effectively out of the reach of Jezebel's wrath. While that no doubt brought some relief to Elijah, he was not a happy man. Elijah is now as depressed in chapter 19 as he was jubilant in chapter 18 in the wake of his victory. Why? To him it appears that he may have won the battle, but maybe lost the war. 
He'd been trying to get the northern kingdom of Israel to stop worshiping idols and to return to the worship of Yahweh. But it was an uphill battle, especially with Baal worship having the official sanction of the royal court. Even when he proved Yahweh's superiority without question on Mount Carmel and disposed of all of the other guy's prophets, the culture was not changed. People still worship Baal, led by their queen. So Elijah does what any good pastor would do under such circumstances. He sits under a solitary broom tree and says, I want to die, take my life, Lord. I am no use to anybody at all. And like almost every depressed person, he hides from the world in sleep. The thing about the calling of God, however, is that it does not go away. You can't run from it, as Jonah discovered, and you can't sleep it away either. Elijah's sleep is interrupted by an angel who brings him food and drink. Elijah gets up, eats as the angel commands, and then goes right back to sleep again. The angel comes back a second time, and it happens again. Come on, Elijah, snap out of it. Eat, drink, get your strength up. You got a journey to make. So Elijah gets up, and he eats and drinks again, and he travels 40 days to Horeb, the mountain of God. How many days? 40. Remember what we talked about last week? 40 almost never means 40. It's a symbolic number in the Bible for a difficult, horrible, and often life-threatening time. This passage talks about Mount Horeb, but most people know it better by another name. Mount Horeb is also Mount Sinai. Apparently one face, like the northern face, was called Mount Horeb, and the southern face of the same mountain was called Sinai, but they are the Horeb and Sinai are the same mountain. And like Moses before him, Elijah goes up that mountain, maybe making a pilgrimage, to seek the wisdom of God. Elijah's complaint under the broom tree was that the people had rejected God's commandments. And so he goes back to the very place those commandments were given centuries earlier to make his case. Again, the word of the Lord finds him this time in a cave on the mountain. Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah's depression is serious. Even after that long, hard journey and the climb up the mountain, it has not gone away. I've done my job. I've done everything for you, and I have totally spent myself in that effort. I've done everything I can to wipe out the worship of Baal from your people, but it hasn't worked. All those commandments you gave Moses right here on this mountain, well, they're not following them. I'm the only one left who worships you, and now they're trying to kill me. The angel's unmoved. Go out of your cave, Elijah. Come out of the dark and stand on the mountain. God's going to pay you a visit. In the next verses, we're meant to remember the days of Moses on that same mountain. When Moses brought Israel to Sinai, the mountain quaked and burned and smoked and blew, just as it does with Elijah. But while God appears out of the fire to Moses, speaks out of the whirlwind to Job, and shows up with earthquakes in many places in the Bible. Elijah experiences earth, wind, and fire, but doesn't find God in any of those things. Instead, it's suddenly quiet, too quiet. The kind of quiet where even the noises that are supposed to be there are not there, and you know something's up. Elijah steps out into the silence, where he hears what the King James Version beautifully translates as the still small voice of God. But however gentle the voice, the question from God is the same as from the angel. What are you doing here, Elijah? 
And Elijah's answer is the same. Even being in the very presence of God has not lifted his dejected spirit. Now, I don't know what you would expect from God in such a situation, but I think I would have expected a little more understanding than Elijah gets. There's no, there, there, Elijah, it'll get better. There's no, you know, I understand how you feel. You've had it rough. Why don't you just head down to the Nile for a couple weeks vacation? Nope. God doesn't even acknowledge Elijah's feelings. Go anoint a couple of new kings, Elijah. And while you're at it, get a successor for yourself. Then the kicker comes down in verse 18. Oh, and by the way, you're not the only one left. There are still 7,000 others in Israel who do not worship Baal. As we see with the Bible's main characters from Adam on down, life in God's service is not necessarily safe in the way that we usually use that term. Both Moses and Elijah had to confront kings, and both Moses and Elijah had armies sent after them as a result. But when Elijah wears out with the work, God feeds him, just as Moses got manna from heaven. There are lots and lots of similarities between Moses and Elijah, and by putting this story on the same mountain, I believe we're meant to connect the two figures. But to what end? I think a big part of the point for both Moses and Elijah is that even for those with as an important calling as each of them had, they should not expect the work to be finished in their lifetimes. We'll see that more poignantly with Moses next week, but the same is true for Elijah. On the one hand, Elijah is understandably depressed because he's exhausted. He's had to flee his own country because the king and queen want to kill him. That'll depress anybody. In addition to the exhaustion, Elijah feels alone in his struggle. That feeling of isolation is very common in depression, which is why talking about how we feel to others is a critical component in healing. If everybody hides the hardships they're dealing with in an attempt to appear invulnerable and perfect, or sometimes for Christians to be, my faith is so strong that I, ju I, I don't have any bad feelings. No, I can just get through this thing. Um, we end up that way with a bunch of people in the same community going through the exact same thing with everybody feeling like they're the only one. In churches, that's more and more common the further up the economic and social ladder you go. We can come to believe that hardship is visited only on the weak, those without faith enough, which is not the witness of the Bible at all. Jesus himself directly contradicts that attitude. And yet, if we have the means to disguise and hide our troubles, we typically do and it comes at a huge cost to our mental health. But we won't admit our mental health struggles either, so it becomes an unvirtuous cycle. Support groups of various types are so helpful, not just because you can pick up helpful coping strategies or find out what kind of help is available. They're helpful first and foremost by confirming that we are not alone. Lots of other people, all the people in this group are struggling just like we are, or they have in the past. The burden is lighter the minute it is shared and someone steps forward to say, not here's how to fix it, but you know what, me too. God addresses this feeling with Elijah by telling him that there are 7,000 people in Israel who are still faithful. He's not the only one. But the thing that really seems to weigh most on Elijah is that he thinks his inability to stop the worship of Baal in Israel means that the worship of Yahweh will come to an end once Elijah dies. And he sees that coming closer in the rearview mirror. 
Everything first accomplished there on the mountain of God, he thinks, the Torah given to Moses, the establishment of Israel as God's people who would be a witness to the world of God's glory, and the promise made to Abraham to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. It will all come to a screeching halt once he's gone, and that date seems to be approaching as quickly as Jezebel's chariots. Elijah isn't even asking God for anything here. It's almost like he's personally carried the covenant that God made with Moses back to its source to lay it back at God's feet before he dies. It was passed down for centuries until it came to him and he failed. So he crawls back to the place it all began and let the end come as it may. But God does not indulge that for a single minute. God sends him right back into the fray. Go anoint a couple more kings, Elijah. Clearly we need some new ones. Oh, and get yourself a successor. In fact, I picked one out for you. His name is so close to yours that it's gonna confuse people for millennia. Go find Elisha, the son of Shaphat, and train him to take over your work. We are not done here. My work is bigger than any one prophet. It was bigger than Abraham, it was bigger than Moses, and it is bigger than you. Well, okay then, that's what Elijah does. Finding Elisha is the very next thing that happens in the story. And there are quite a few chapters and even more years of war and calling down fire and a grisly end to King Ahab and Queen Jezebel before that fiery chariot swoops down and picks up Elijah and takes him into heaven. Elisha then literally picks up Elijah's mantle and continues the work. What Elijah had to face on the mountain of God is a key teaching of the Lenten desert. We may have critically important roles in our jobs, in our families, in our church, or even in the broadest reaches of society. We might be presidents or kings or prophets or popes. We might lead billion dollar businesses or negotiate peace and war between nations. All those things will come to an end eventually. Even nations will rise and fall. Dust we are and to dust we shall return. But when the work is truly God's work, there will always be someone to pick up the mantle when our part in that work is through. When we're exhausted, God provides strength for the journey. When we think we're alone, God says, look, there are thousands of others in the exact same boat. When we think God's work is doomed because our part in it is coming to an end, God says, I have a successor lined up and have booked you a fiery Uber to come home. Well, okay then, better get up and eat and see it through. Amen. Do we have, as Laura's gonna come through now and pick up pick up prayer requests. Um, we got any birthdays this week? Yes, Judy. Awesome. <laughs> All the Staffords, so two, two grandkids and Judy. All right, Colin. Awesome. Awesome. Colin's, Colin's whole family's having birthdays. Yes, Jeanette. Knee. I saw a crutch come in. Yes. Yes, prayer for, prayer for your knee. Any other birthdays before we sing? All right. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. 
Amen. Um, as a celebration, uh, Joyce Cummings reports that Bill got home safely after his fall and is healing well. Um, so she is grateful for your prayers. She's also grateful he's getting well because she can stay in Florida a little bit longer and doesn't have to come home. <laughs> so we, we celebrate that good news with Joyce. Uh, please lift up Mike Burke, who will be entering hospice on Monday. Um, Jay's brother-in-law, the, the brother of Jay's brother-in-law of Kim Burke. No. Brother, I was wondering how that worked. <laughs> it's Kim Burke's brother-in-law, Mike, entering hospice. Um, prayers for Bob going in the hospital, has cancer to try chemo, and for Jared, um, refreshment in his life and also his music. Of prayers for Kathy Carr, for Jim Butler, and for Ukraine. And prayers for Michael Egan. Uh, he has stomach cancer and will be operated on Monday. Pete and Joanne Hobson's nephew. And let us wrap that in a moment of silence as the Lord speaks to us and we speak to God in our silence and then I'll conclude with a pastoral prayer adapted from a prayer by 16-year-old Audrey White. Let's pray. God, please guide our feet that we may walk in the light of peace. Guide our hands that we may stretch them out to those in need. Guide our arms that we may embrace your broken children and those that we do not know. Guide our eyes that we may see the things that unite us with all the people of the world. Guide our ears that we may hear the weeping of creation. Guide our tongues that we may speak only kindness, never destruction. Guide our dreams that we may see the hope of the future through the despair of the night. Guide our thoughts that we may learn how to create a positive change. God, above all, please guide our hearts that we may love all the children of the world, seek justice for the oppressed, and live humbly under your hope. In the name of your grace. Amen.